So our first session is titled Testing, Assessment and the Scientific Movement in Education from the Thorndikes to the Present. This session will honor and critically explore the historic contributions of leading scholars from TC, such as Edward Lee Thorndike and his son Robert Ladd Thorndike, along with major thinkers in and outside TC who shaped the science and field of educational measurement as it has evolved over time into a worldwide testing in and evaluation industry. Now you see some of the very big names here uh, actually on this panel. Um, we will also remember TC's early presence in international assessment programs such as the PISA um, through the involvement of Robert Thorndike, Harry Passau, Richard Wolff, Arthur Fauché, and other faculty, touching on the place and value of such programs today. We will also shed light on contemporary issues and associated policies in testing and accountability that are influencing public education today. So our first speaker is Professor Robert Brennan. Uh, the title of his talk is The Future, sorry, I got the wrong, Some Milestones in the History of Educational Measurement. I'd say a few words to introduce Professor Brennan to you. Dr. Robert Brennan is the E.F. Lindquist Chair in Measurement and Testing and Director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Measurement and Assessment in the College of Education of the University of Iowa. He is the author or co-author of numerous journal articles and several books, including Generalizability Theory. I own that book. I hope he will autograph it um, uh, before he leaves. And Test Equating, Scaling, and Linking Methods and Practices. Also, he is the editor of the fourth edition of Educational Measurement, uh, which was published in 2006. Now, this is the single most important handbook and reference book that we have in educational measurement that is published every decade or so. It's only the very prominent names who, whose works are represented, and he uh, is the editor, so that gives you a sense of how important his role has been in the field of educational measurement. Robert Thorndike um, actually was the editor of the second edition of educational measurement, just to give an institutional connection. Uh, Dr. Brennan has served as Vice President of Division D of the American Educational Research Association, President of NCME, which is the National Council on Measurement in Education. He was also um, the co-recipient of the 2000 NCME Award for Career Contributions to Educational Measurement, the 2004 EF Lindquist Award for Contributions to the Field of Educational Measurement, and the recipient of the 2011 Career Achievement Award from the Association of Test Publishers. Thank you for coming, Dr. Brennan. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madhavi. It's a pleasure to be here. I very much appreciate the, the invitation. I've chosen to organize my comments today along, depending upon how much time it takes, four or five different topics. Uh, first, 1900 to 1950, that period of time. Second, 1950 to the present. Third, some enduring issues. And fourth, some comments about the future. I'll note at the beginning that when Madhavi invited me to give this presentation, she very gently suggested I might want to say some words about E.L. Thorndike, and I will. Uh, however, clearly, uh, Professor Burke, can speak more knowledgeably and eloquently than me. I at least will be able to say, I think, that I don't, I'm not going to make anything, that's, any statements that are heretical, given uh, what he just said. So I thought I'd like to start with a couple of comments about uh, Edward Lee Thorndike, and I'll try not to repeat those that have already been made. In my little efforts at research into, into E.L. Thorndike, one thing kept on reoccurring, a statement, anything that exists, exists in some amount and can be measured. I was never able to determine that that's the exact quote, but I saw it in several different places, and it certainly seems to form, in my mind, uh, a kind of impression of how he thought about the world. 
He was a student of William James at Harvard. That's where I got my degree, so I saw some relevance there. He grew up in Lowell. I grew up in eastern Massachusetts. I saw some relevance there. He has a kind of lineage going back to Galton. Pearson was, was a student of Galton, I believe, as was Cattell. Thorndike was a student of Cattell. And that suggests that correlation was probably going to be a fairly big issue in Edward Lee Thorndike's view of the world, as I believe it was. He's certainly known as the father of modern educational psychology. Excuse me. There. Certainly known as the father of modern educational psychology, I saw several references to 508 publications, um, which trumps mine by a factor of at least five. <clears throat> I believe he was the author of one of the first, if, the, if not the first, book that introduced statistics to educational psychology. He certainly appeared to have an influence on the field of classical test theory as it was developing uh, in the uh, early part of the 20th century. He certainly played a role in the alpha, on the alpha and beta tests. There is a paper he wrote that essentially, I think, is one of the very first papers on the subject of equating. He, he argued in that paper that basically correlation and regression as understood at that point well, not necessarily such a good, uh, good way to approach the issues of equating, which I thought was quite insightful. Uh, I believe he was the advisor of Truman Kelly, who subsequently became well-known at, at Harvard University. And he was, I think, um, the person, one of the two persons who was um, the source of the T in T-scores. It's been reported that he disliked any abstract discussion not tied to concrete facts. I believe that suggests he was indeed an empiricist. Uh, it, it definitely appeared to me that he was a very tolerant person, uh, willing to accept divergent views, but he did really want to see what the evidence was for, for whatever those views may have been. I submit that he did indeed influence the fields of educational psychology for certain, but also the field of testing as we understand it today. A few words about the early part of the 20th century, 1900 to 1950. That, that seems to me, in my <coughs> mind, the, area, the period of time when classical test theory was being developed, uh, along with factor analysis. I'm going to focus mainly on classical test theory. This is an extraordinarily simple model. It says that an observed score can be decomposed into two parts, a true score and an error score. The trouble with the model is not its simplicity, it's that to the right of the equal sign are two things that we can't observe directly. That led to, or in part caused, I think, uh, Spearman to consider issues having to do with the correction for attenuation. And in a sense, that really was the beginnings of classical test theory. And the insight Spearman had was, to my mind, remarkable. Subsequently, probably the best known work was by Spearman and Brown in their development of the formula for answering a question like, what will the reliability of tests be if you double it? And then Cooter and Richardson in 1937, developed procedures, statistics, in order to estimate this thing called reliability. Hoyt did the same kind of thing, but from the perspective of analysis of variance. All of these and other things were summarized brilliantly, I think, in a book by Harold Gulickson that was published in 1950. It's still in print, and it is still a very readable and very good book. Probably the most cited Classical test theory development isn't quite in 1950, it was in 1951, when Lee Crombach published a paper on what came to be called coefficient alpha. It is, I think, without question, the most used statistic in measurement and probably the most misused as well at the same time. 
To the end of his life, one of the last papers Lee Crombeck wrote with the help of Rich Chavelson was kind of a celebration of 50 years since the publication of that 1951 paper. But it wasn't entirely fully a celebration because Crombeck wasn't entirely happy with this, this thing he had created. First of all, he said, correctly so, others had basically come up with the same statistic. Secondly, therefore he didn't think it should be associated solely with his name. Secondly, if you carefully read that paper, if you go back to it, you'll see in a footnote that it said, this is one of several papers that I expect to subsequently write having to do with coefficient alpha, coefficient beta, coefficient delta, etc. And he never did that. He never did that because subsequently he was led to the development of what came to be called generalizability theory. Up to that point in time as well, just about all notions of validity, not entirely, but just about all of them, had to do with predictive validity. But then, after that, everything changed. From the 1950s onward, there was a remarkable, truly remarkable development, I think, of not only many different testing programs, but many different ways to think about and model testing. I'll just mention the most obvious few. In 1968, Fred Lord and Melnovic published a, a book that's still relevant today, Statistical Theories of Mental Test Scores, relevant and challenging. In 1972, Crownback and three of his colleagues published their work which in the area which came to be known as generalizability theory, although that phrase actually isn't in the title of the book. It's impossible to overlook what happened in the area of item response theory during that period of time with people like Fred Lloyd, Rush, Daryl Bach, Bob Mislevy, who's in the audience today, and many others. Also, towards the middle of the, this period of time, 1950 on, there was a great deal of development in equating and in scaling, led principally by Bill Angoff. The field began to recognize that it needed to have more cohesion, cohesion, more standards. During that period of time, since 1950, there have been five, soon to be six, editions of the standards for educational and psychological testing. At the same time, the field was expanding so greatly that it appeared as if there need to be compendiums or some books that kind of put it all together. They came to be called Educational Measurement, the first of which was published in 1950, 51, excuse me, and edited by uh, E.F. Lindquist. Uh, the second by Robert Thorndike, the third by Bob Lynn, the fourth by myself. And those have come to be viewed as kind of the Bibles in the field, at least for the time periods they, they cover. Throughout this period of time, as I indicated in the last slide, the, the concepts and notions about validity just exploded. It's not all in positive directions, in my opinion. But there can be no argument about the fact that the developments were fundamental to the field and made tremendous contributions down the road. Uh, in that context, certainly the names of Lee Crombeck, Sam Messick, and currently Mike Kane deserve to be mentioned. There's obviously a vastly increased amount of educational testing and an ever-increasing use of computers in various aspects of testing, starting out with just scoring tests, but clearly going much further than that. And finally, as testing became more and more prevalent, the politics of testing became more and more important as well. So politics definitely have become a dominant influence on, on what goes on in the field. I wanted to mention a few issues, however, that seem to me to be enduring somewhat contentious on occasion, but I think I can trace something about each of these back to the early 1900s. 
There's always been something of a tension between ability testing and achievement testing, between norm-reference testing and criterion-reference testing, even when those terms didn't exist in that form, between formative and summative evaluation, and finally, especially these days, measuring status versus measuring growth. If I had more time, I'd go into these in more detail, but I really don't. So I just want to say a few words about the last one, measuring status versus measuring growth. It is so natural to consider measuring status, but it is equally natural to consider measuring growth. And if we go back even to the 1900s, early 1900s, it's evident that both played a role. Growth, however, or change or gain has been perhaps the single most enduring problem, I think, in the field of educational measurement. It's not that we can't do it. It's that we've got too many ways to do it, and we don't really know which one's the best way to do it in which context. That's gone on for at least 70 years, if not 100. I don't see it ending soon because it is an inherent issue that we are going to have to address in considerable detail as the Common Core state standards get adopted by states throughout the country and used. That is an issue that is not going to go away. <clears throat> In the future, I would hope we would see more of an integration of our measurement models. Use of improved validation practices some adoption of richer assessment frameworks and formats that capitalize on appropriate use of technology, and improved communication of assessment results to different audiences. Those of us who are measurement experts or psychometricians or whatever you might choose to call us, we cannot live in a vacuum. We have to be able to deal with communicating results. And we also need many more trained measurement professionals, given the nature of what's going on in the field. I'm optimistic that we can at least approach achieving these goals, but I would be less than honest if I didn't tell you that I consider these challenges to be formidable. Thank you for the opportunity to, part, to be part of this celebration of the contributions of Teachers College to educational measurement. It is truly the case that Teachers College deserves a great deal of credit for the developments that have gone on within the field, both directly and indirectly. My own associations with Teachers College have not been direct, but there are, there are, there are clearly a number of indirect associations, and I have thereby benefited greatly from the work of others who have gone before me. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Neil Kingston. He's actually one of our own, um, and I will read his biography in a minute. His talk is called Robert Ladd Thorndike, The Man and His Legacies. And a few words about Dr. Kingston. Neil Kingston received his PhD in psychological measurement and research design from Teachers College, Columbia University in 1983. Dr. Kingston, and these are his own words, had the privilege of taking several courses with R.L. Thorndike, as well as with his advisor, Marv Sontag, his dissertation chair, Richard Wolf, Elizabeth Hagen, Jane Monroe, Owen Whitby, Carl Heiner, and Edmund Gordon who is sitting here. <laughs> Dr. King Kingston worked as a psychometrician and then executive at several testing organizations as Associate Commissioner of Education in Kentucky during the early years of the Kentucky Education Reform Act and currently is a professor in the psychology and research in, in education department at the University of Kansas. He serves as the director of the Achievement and Assessment Institute and co-director of the Center for Educational Research and Evaluation. His research focuses on helping large-scale assessments that better support student learning. Dr. Kingston is the principal investigator of the Dynamic Learning Maps Alternate Assessment Consortium, 17 states, 
building a radically different assessment system for students with significant cognitive disabilities. I turn it over to Dr. Kingston. Uh, Bob Brennan just presented on the vast breadth of educational measurement. I will now talk about just one man. Though within that one man, you will see a breadth that's incredible. My name is Neil Kingston. Some of this you've heard already. I had the privilege of studying at Teachers College primarily between 1974 and 1978. I started as a non-matriculated student in 1974, enrolled in the psychology and education master's program in the fall of 1975, and the PhD program in psychological measurement and research design in fall of 1976. The first two years I worked full-time as a science teacher in Yonkers, New York, taking classes in the afternoon and evening. In fact, um, for budget reasons, they were supposed to lay me off. So my last semester, I registered for 17 credits at TC, and then they didn't lay me off. So I was working full time uh, and uh, trying to get here for uh, a bunch of classes. It did not go quite as well as I would have hoped. Um, the second two years, I was a full time uh, student at Teachers College uh, and a teaching assistant and consultant in the computer lab. Uh, back in a time where everyone brought in their computer projects in boxes with decks of Hollerith cards that got read into card readers. I don't believe I'm old, but when I talk like this, I start to feel a little bit old. Um, I finished my coursework in all but the last chapter of my dissertation in 1978, and then immersed myself in more interesting work, and did not finish my dissertation until I finally took a job I hated. <laughs> this encouraged me to complete my discussion chapter, and I received my PhD in 1983. Thus, I went to the same Columbia graduation as President Barack Obama. One takes one's brushes with destiny where one may. Many faculty at Teachers College had a significant influence on both my personal and professional life. I had been a poor, unfocused, and undisciplined student in high school, and three undergraduate colleges with social skills at perhaps a tad lower level. For those of you who are parents wrestling with children who may have been somewhat like what I was, there is hope. You heard earlier a comment about rebellion, rebelliousness and birth order. I was a middle child. My advisor, Mav Sontag, helped me through a few difficult moments as I was overcoming my past deficits while at graduate school. Edmund Gordon, Betty Hagen, and Dick Wolf were phenomenal teachers who opened my inexperienced mind to many important ideas. Dick Lindemann, Ruth Gold, and Owen Whitby provided me with the invaluable uh, statistical training. While I always realized Bob Thorndike, and by the way, I could never bring myself to call him Bob while he was alive, but I will explain my newfound comfort with such familiarity later, had an important impact on my professional life it was only in preparing to give this talk that I realized how unknowingly he had been the most important role model in my professional career. But to get to the point, I want to first talk about R.L. Thorndike. Hmm, I guess I'm not totally comfortable calling him Bob. From four perspectives. Genealogical, historical, professional, and human. Genealogically, we can position R.L. Thorndike in his own words as the ham in the middle of the sandwich. His father, E.L. Thorndike, was one of the founding giants of the field of educational psychology. His son, R.M. Thorndike, is also an expert in assessment and research methods. And now his granddaughter, Tracy Thorndike Christ, though a member, faculty member at Western Washington University in special education, is becoming increasingly known in measurement circles, including but not limited to, as co-author of the eighth edition of the book R.L. first published in 1955, Measurement and Evaluation in Psychology and Education. I guess as the generations continue and the levels increase, we must talk about R.L. as part of a club sandwich. <laughs> to provide some historical context, let me mention some dates and events that surround R.L. Thorndike's life. 
R.L. Thorndike was born September 22nd, 1910. At that time, Spearman's underpinnings of what is now known as classical test theory were six years old. The Binet-Simon intelligence test was five years old. And the Stanford Binet would not be developed for six more years. The Kansas silent reading test, the first large-scale assessment to use selected response items two years before the Army Alpha, was still five years away. E.L. Thorndike has been attributed with creating the selected response item for research purposes. But I have found no definitive reference. As an aside, I'll take advantage of the, pul of the pulpit up here. I requested to be allowed to look at the E.L. Thorndike archives at Teachers College to try and find any evidence. But alas, I was told I could not have access. However, Frederick Kelly, the creator of the Kansas Silent Reading Test and third dean of the University of Kansas School of Education, was one of E.L.'s students. R.L. graduated Wesleyan, as at his father and would his son, in 1931 with a bachelor's degree in mathematics. His father said, uh, don't follow my footsteps in English. Math, that's where it's at. I don't think E.L. phrased it quite that way. but uh, He went to Columbia University receiving a PhD in 1935. His dissertation, Organization of Behavior in the Albino Rat, used factor analysis to differentiate learning factors in rats. As an aside, in preparing for this paper, I discovered that looking at correlations among rat learning abilities was a hot topic in the 1930s, with many researchers with whose work I am not familiar engaging in such research, but also another well-known psychometrician, Quinn McNamara, who went on to author the 1942 revision of the Stanford Binet. So the obvious advice to would-be authors of future editions of the Stanford Binet would be, well, never mind that. Um, let me add that his uh, factor analysis of um, 64 rats, 32 different measures, had to be calculated by hand. Now, whether one, I would question doing a factor analysis with 32 variables and 64 subjects. Uh, however, back in the 1930s, this was heady stuff. And you had to do it by hand. And doing a correlation coefficient took long enough. Uh, doing uh, factor analysis was a monumental task. And he did a couple of them, actually, back in that hand done time. Thorndike taught at George Washington University for two years, starting in 1934, first as an instructor and then as an assistant professor. From 1936 through 39, he was an assistant professor at Teachers College. From 1940 to 48, he was an associate professor. He was a full professor from 48 to 76 when he formally retired as a faculty member, though not as a researcher and test author. He remained an active teacher as an emeritus professor for several years, including uh, the period when I took several courses with him. Uh, and at some point, he was appointed to the Richard March Ho Endowed Chair, but I could not find the date of that appointment. As an aside, I always wondered who Richard March Ho was, haven't you all? Uh, Richard March Ho invented the first successful rotary printing press in 1846, and later was co-inventor of the web printing press. Back to R.L. Thorndike. From 1942 through 46, he served as a research psychologist in the Army Air Force, working in a group headed by John Flanagan and with J.P. Guilford and Paul Horst. And I believe you can find the influences of all of these people on much of his work from this period uh, on forward. I believe this opportunity to work on important practical measurement problems helped shape his career in powerful ways. After more than 50 years of important influence on the field of measurement, R.L. Thorndike passed away September 21st, 1990, the day before his 80th birthday. Too early. I'll get back to that. Robert L. Thorndike made major contributions in at least five important areas, test developer, psychometrician, industrial and military psychologist, educational researcher, and teacher. His contributions in each one of these areas established an intellectual legacy, but combined, they show an amazing breadth combined with depth that is highly unusual. RL was highly productive, so my first actions in preparing this talk were to try to get a copy of his Vita. Unfortunately, th 
This is all that can be found in the Teachers College archives. Stops in, I believe, 1935, so um, left a few mysteries. Undaunted, well, slightly daunted, I used Harzing's publish, publish or Perish software, which uses Google Scholar to perform an author impact analysis. Publish or Perish identified 333 papers between 1933, the effect of the interval between test and retest on constancy of IQ, published in the Journal of Educational Psychology when he was in his second year of graduate school, and his posthumous third authorship of the Cognitive Abilities Test as revised in 2001. His papers were cited a composite 11,108 times, and I'm going to uh, go forward a little faster because this is taking longer than I thought. So uh, I used that. I used the title of all of his papers to create a Wordle. Those who don't know the Wordle website, you can put in any piece of uh, work, and it'll then uh, put the words in size order that it found there. So we find a couple of themes that come out of this Wordle here. Uh, intelligence, measurement, evaluation, test, intelligence, measurement, evaluation, education, Stanford, Binet, cognitive, and psychology uh, dominate the titles of his papers. Thorndike is known perhaps best for his construction of, uh, in test construction and theory of measurement as author of the Stanford Binet 1986 ed edition. He was also known for his work on the Lord Thorndike Intelligence Test 1966, the successor cognitive abilities test, Thorndike Dimensions of Temperament uh, also. Um, skipping on to applied psychometrics. Um, this was a copy, this is a part of the um, 1947 report. Uh, he finished writing it in 1946. It didn't come out until 1947. Out of the Army Air Force work that had gone on uh, that solidified his ideas on a number of subjects. Uh, he was a major in the uh, uh, program at the time, and uh, he was uh, the person who was assigned to summarize the group's work. Uh, that's the copy of the actual report. This report is noteworthy because, uh, though most people have never seen it, never heard of it, uh, it had a profound effect on measurement in that he gave his, he, he summarized detailed thinking about different sources of error variance uh, in test scores, and in many ways, these underpinnings uh, were highly related to uh, successive work in uh, generalizability theory by others, uh, and uh, also continued in his 1951 chapter of reliability in the first edition of Educational Measurement uh, and uh, his uh, textbook. I'm going to skip over the applied psychometrics because I have to get to the part that I really liked uh, in, in doing my uh, research here. Not sure what I'm doing wrong. Okay, face this way. The quirky Bob Thorndike. So I found this article, 1941, Words in the Comics. Uh, comic books were a new phenomenon. Uh, in 1938 is when the modern comic, comic book came about. Uh, and there was lots of controversy about comic books. And uh, Bob Thorndike was the one to take on this controversy about whether they would, could be helpful or harmful in the learning of reading. But it's how he went about doing it that was so uh, impressive to me. Um, he uh, was very rigorous and very analytical. Uh, he got some comic books, which, by the way, would be worth many thousands of dollars for each issue nowadays. Uh, many tens of thousands, actually, I think, for most of these. Uh, looked at the number of words in the comic book. Uh, looked at the Thorndike list that his father had developed of the frequency of words, uh, counted the number of words in each thousand of the frequency that was associated with, with them, found words that were not on the Thorndike list. So, so notice comic books were far ahead of what was being looked at at reading in words like, if I can find the pointer over there, aircraft, airplane, airport. Oh, these were not common when E.L. Thorndike created his word list, of course. Um, summarized uh, in a very uh, academic, uh, appropriately academic way uh, about words <coughs> in the comics. But it was his 1953 Psychometrica presidential address that I really enjoyed. I have to come here because I didn't write the words down. Uh, he started this article with something that I thought was very
but I really <laughs> wish I knew him back then like I know him a little bit better uh, now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chird Plomp. Professor Plomp is from the University of Twente at the, in the Netherlands. And I will give you a little bit of his background and then turn it over to him. Professor Plump is Professor Emeritus of the University of Twente, uh, where he was the Professor in Curriculum Development and Evaluation from 1981 to 1999. He represented the, the Netherlands in the General Assembly of the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement, otherwise known as the IEA, from 1987 to 1989. He was the Chair of the IEA from 1989 to 1999. During his time with IEA, he served as chair of the uh, Computers in Education Study, which is called COMPED, uh, the acronym, the third International Mathematics and Science Study, otherwise known as the TIMS, and the second International Technology in Education Study, CITES. He was also study director for the IEA CITES study in 2006, which surveyed schools and teachers of mathematics and science on technology and computer use and related pedagogical approaches. The title of his presentation, he'll be speaking to us about TC's role in IEA over the years. Um, the title is The Founding and Development of the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement and reflections on the contributions of TC's faculty. Uh, it's very special for me to be here. I'm not a psychometrician, I'm a curriculum person, but I spent a lot of time of my life on IA, the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement, and in that period Dick Wolf and I became very good friends. So I didn't have to think very long when I got the invitation to talk about it. However, my involvement with IA only started in 1978. And the question was, please talk about the early days of IA, 1958, and so on. On my last slide, you will see the many people I consulted to get a good grip on the early days of IA. I knew about it somewhat, but what I did not knew was how much this college, teachers' college, has contributed to, let us say, establishing the thinking in IA about how to do, how to conduct international comparative assessment. So what I will do is first say a few words about the IA, its conception and the early days of the IA, the early studies, I will already point to the input by TC scholars, and then in the end, I just briefly list all those people, and I was impressed about the number, I can tell you, of TC scholars in, in, involved in IA studies. First, about the IA. It is an independent international cooperative of national research institutions and governmental research agencies. I think at this moment, more than 65 members uh, are there. It was founded in 1958, I will tell you about it later, although it became a legal entity in 1967 only. Its mission is to conduct international comparative research studies and education, mainly on achievement, and up till now more than 30 comparative research studies have been conducted in the fields of math and science, you may have heard about trends in mathematics and science studies, in reading, civic education, ICT and education, teacher education, and so on. The first studies of IA are a pilot study. I'll tell you later about how the study got started. A pilot study to explore whether 
an international comparative study of educational achievement would be possible. And it has been reported by a scholar from TC, uh, Arthur Fauchier, or Wells Fauchier, was the first editor. Uh, Bob Thorndike was one of the editors, of, of the contributors, and there were three others. But the first two were Fauchier and Thorndike. This was followed in 1964 of a study of mathematics. At that time, it was called Cross-National Study of Mathematics. Nowadays, we call it the first international mathematics study because we had many more. That was followed by the six-subject study, uh, study of science, reading, lit reading literature, French, English, civics, and so on. And I limit myself to those studies because it was in those studies that scholars of teachers called it had an, um, an impact. It started all in 1958. Until then, comparative education was mainly focusing on comparing educational system and like Fauchier is writing in, in his chapter on the report of the first study, the, the roots were in a sort of cultural analysis of education system, and that was the comparison. There was no comparison until then of how well do students learn, what were the factors influencing or having an impact on the learning. And it was the wish to do that sort of analysis that brought a group of people to the UNESCO Institute for Education in Hamburg, and there in 1958 there was the first discussion. This was followed by a next meeting a year later in the same place, but one month later, or maybe one week later, there was the third meeting in Eldon Palace. And the focus of all these meetings were, as indicated here, can we use test results cross-nationally? as an input, as a supplement to look at teachers, at, at pupils' records in schools. What can we learn from doing an comparative, international comparative study? And would it be possible to conduct an international comparative study of achievement? And the conclusion was, let us do it. And because I'm speaking here, uh, a few words about the US participants in this meeting. The first meeting in Hamburg, there was Willard Olson from Michigan. In the second meeting, there was Arnold Anderson and Benjamin Bloom from Chicago. But the Elton meeting, there were three people from this college, Arthur or Wells Fauchier, Bob Thorndike, and Henry Passo. And they were all there because they were motivated. And the anecdote about Thorndike illustrated. They were meeting in London, Elton Palace. Thorndike had a class to teach on a Wednesday. He took the plane Tuesday evening, taught his class, took the plane back to London Wednesday evening, and continued to participate in the meeting that illustrates the motivation of that group that was there together. A number of people, a number of scholars from the US, but also from the UK, Torsten Hussein, you may have heard of him from Sweden, and so on. And who attended as well was Rush, well known of the model, but Denmark did not participate in the study and it took another 30 years, they told me, before the Rush approach model was applied in IA studies. So this all led to the first study, the pilot study in 12 countries, focusing on achievement in reading comprehension, mathematics, science, geography, and nonverbal ability. 
The target population in those 12 countries was 13 years, 13 years old. There were judgment samples, 120 items in the test, coordinated from the UNESCO Institute in Hamburg, but the data analysis and the reporting was largely coordinated from teachers' college. I already mentioned uh, the report. I have a copy here if you're interested. Uh, and Bob Thorndike supervised the data analysis, and Wells Fauché and Bob Thorndike were involved in the reporting, especially doing the international comparative achievement. I want to point you to a well-known, one day it will happen. What do I wrong? This is now the other direction. Yeah. This quote from Wells Fauché is still used by the IEA as a sort of raison d'etre for IA type of studies. If custom and law define what is educational allowable within a nation, the educational system beyond one's national boundaries suggests what is educational possible. The field of competitive education exists to examine these possibilities. I think that is expressing precisely the mission of IEA, and it was Wells Fauché who phrased this, and we are still using it. Some conclusions from the first study are, although there were problems, it is worthwhile to do because we have interesting, meaningful findings. The first study, the exploratory study, gave rise to many hypotheses, and although there were problems, the conclusion was, let us continue. Um, and they continued, they decided to continue with a study to focus on one topic, mathematics, and to do technically a better study. The new study was coordinated from the University of Chicago, Ben Bloom, and at that time, Dick Wolf, who came in 1968 to Teachers College, was there, and he was responsible for the measurement part. The IA Standing Committee met in New York, here at Teachers College, with Thorsten Hussein as chair, but as members, Thorndike, Wells Fauché, and Harry Passo, and Teachers College represented the United States in this study this first, what we now call first mathematics study. I heard, I read, that researchers were not so much interested in mathematics per se. They wanted to have an achievement outcome against which they could study all sorts of variables, independent variables, on the effect on achievement. I was at that time member of the National Committee in the Netherlands, and Hans Freudenthal, you may have heard from him, a well-known math educator, criticized this study and tried to break it down to the ground and get Netherlands out of it. Uh, that illustrates the controversy in, in the field of math education, but also in the field of comparative education. But the conclusion was clear. It is worthwhile to do. Let us learn from our mistakes and our weak points. And uh, let us continue with a study in educational achievement in other domains to see whether what we found for mathematics as dependent variable also can be found for other variables. Only three minutes. OK, I'll speed up. Between the first mathematics study and the six subject study, there was an important meeting, the Lake Mohonk conference, to develop better, stronger theoretical foundations for this type of study. And the participants came from many corners of 
the social sciences, but it was substantively led by Donald Suter, what is the name? Donald Super, who was the first author of a model for educational achievement, a cross-national model for educational achievement based on input process, output, and utilization. Based on the, the work of this group, they started the six subject study. I'm now speeding up even more. Um, they investigated, I don't know the details, factors determining achievement, but again, major involvement of teachers' colleges. The leadership of the study, substantive leadership, was from teachers' college. Bob Thorndike was responsible for reporting the uh, reading comprehension part. Initially, Wells Fauché worked on the literature part, <coughs> but later on, Alan Purvis and I understood he was at that time also in teachers' college, took over. By the way, Alan Purvis became later chair of IEA. About the involvement of teachers, college scholars, so I begin to round off. In the early days of IEA, looking back, there was a strong involvement in the pilot study so with leadership role of Fauché, Thorndike, Passo, and Donald Super. There was leadership in the report of the first study. There was a responsibility in the first mathematics study. Leadership in the six subject study. And later on, I learned that Willard Jacobson had an important role to play together with Rodney Duran and Janice Owen in the second international science study. So if you look at the names, then you can see, at least for me, it was surprising to see that so many teacher college scholars were involved in the early days of IA. I mentioned Bob Thorndike, Harry Possoff, Henri Possoff, Wells Fauché, Donald Super, Harold Noah, Miller Jacobson, Alan Perth, and from Judith Thorny, I learned that uh, Gita Steiner was in the 1990s active in the, in the reading in the civic study, and a few words on Dick Wolf because I worked very close with him. If you allow me, Michel, a few words about this special person. Um, Dick Wolf. He studied under Ben Bloom. Initially at the University of Chicago, involved in IA studies, the first mathematics study. Then he moved to teacher college, where he was responsible as successor of Bob Thorndike for measurement and evaluation and statistics, at least that was told to me. In IEA, he participated in the first math study, in the six subject study in the data analysis, in the second international science study, <coughs> and in the computer and education study where I was the chair and he was a an advisor. I remember I was once meeting with Dick with a draft proposal for the study and he looked at me and said, Cheered, go back home. I met him here. Go back home, rewrite it and put on top of your desk who is my reader. And I never forgot this. And I tell all my graduate students who is your reader because that is what Dick taught us. In the IA, he was the, the General Assembly member for the United States for many years. He was the former chair of the publication and editorial committee, and all this was sufficient, more than sufficient, to make him honorary member. I talked to my colleague in the computer and education study, and he characterized Dick Wolf as, Dick was not there to please you but it was pleasant to work with him. And those of you who know Dick Wolf remember his humor and his characteristic laugh. It was for me a pleasure to investigate the role of TC in IA. I didn't realize there were so many 
people involved in it. I want to congratulate the Teachers College with its anniversary, and I hope for many more years. And I want to give you a book I was one of the co-editors called 50 Years of Experience and Memories about IA. There is the first chapter by John Keeves, who is an important resource person for me, who tells about the IA. There are several persons in the list involved, and um, Dick Wolf has also a chapter in this. So, another time, my congratulations. The next speaker happens to be me. The topic is validity, test use, and consequences, and I'll give you some reflections on um, some recent work that we've done from the uh, Assessment and Evaluation Research Initiative. Our mission at AERI is to promote meaningful use of assessment and evaluation information across disciplines, including, of course, education and internationally. So it will come as no surprise that one, uh, when we had AERI's inaugural conference in 2012, uh, the topic we focused on was validity. In my presentation today, I will discuss a small sampling of what we learned from our deliberations at that meeting and the products that were generated thereof. I thank President Furman for inviting me to present this work as a part of this very distinguished panel today. So uh, I want to just uh, share with you who the authors were. Um, I won't be able to go over the entire list of names, but do please uh, take a look at the publications uh, which are uh, listed in the back of the program, um, and you will see how illustrious the group was that contributed to this thinking. Um, why validity, you might ask? Uh, of course, uh, one reason is uh, that uh, testing has uh, evolved exponentially and has become a global phenomenon. I'm not really coordinating with the slides because I can't see. So let me just first go back. And I'll go back to those slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk to you f first about why we focused on validity. First of all, because there is this exponential rise in, in testing, uh, which has spread to not only the Western countries where standardized large-scale achievement testing was born, which is the United States and the UK uh, uh, for the most part, but also developing regions of the world. Uh, the reason why we were interested is that um, while testing has increased, the validity or the meaningfulness and def defensibility of test scores and test-based information, especially in test use contexts, tends to become threatened. And um, this happens in practice and policy contexts and evaluation contexts all around the world. But um, in reviewing the literature, we found that not all of it has been formally documented, and there's a pattern of recurring issues. So uh, the source of invalidity, or the degrees of validity, if you will, uh, can be inherent in a test. So we, we can think of validity as, uh, as being related to a test which has poorly performing items, or we can think of it as residing completely outside the test, having to do with the ways in which test, test scores or test-based information are put to use in applied decision-making context. The appropriateness of these actions and decisions also have to do with validity. And it's important to look at this because there are often high stakes tied to these test scores and these actions. And the consequences, sometimes unintended, can have an impact on teachers, leaders, school, school districts, and so forth. And if we look at it indirectly, society at large. So to me, it seemed like a big problem. Um, I wanted to invite 
the biggest name, names that we could get last year, uh, to think about this. And we thought of three test use parts in the main part. Uh, 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 in the main. The first one has to do with high stakes te testing of individuals for decision making in contexts such as certification, college admissions, rewards, and so on and so forth. The second, of course, is a popular one. Uh, it has to do with um, validity issues that arise when test-based information is used in models of teacher evaluation and school accountability. Third had to do with validity issues in international large-scale assessments, including the IEA studies, and of course, you've heard about the PISA. And More to the screen, okay. <laughs> All right, so, and then we looked at, uh, there were, there's a companion volume where um, you, you can see we looked at more US-based applications. And again, the authors are very prominent names. So I've already told you why. I want to give you, a, a, cause a little more drama if I can. Where is it? by referring to the PISA results, which were just out. How many of you have been keeping up with the news? OK, good. <laughs> and of course, the backlash having to do with the Common Core testing. Um, so no one in this country is happy or celebrating the results of the international comparisons on the 2012 PISA that ranks American students right in the middle of the pack, just as before. They're just not getting better. And uh, particularly in math and science, there's a lot of concern. Uh, now, if we think about it, the people are talking about has uh, American education really failed all these students? Performance of students has stagnated over time on the PISA. Reforms have failed. Uh, new reforms are needed. But let's also consider the alternative hypotheses. PISA is a sample survey. It's an achievement testing, but it's a sample survey. Can you really make causal connections between specific reforms and student performance? The other thing we can also think of is what about the cultural context of nations and national education systems and a million other variables, including grade level differences of 15-year-olds and the kinds of uh, educational experiences they have uh, before they take a test like the PISA. After all, you need the tools and the concepts for problem solving from the subject matter that we're taught. So um, when we look at that and make great um, inter-country comparisons, uh, how meaningful are the results? So I, I want to begin by saying, when carefully interpreted PISA results can yield useful benchmarks within nations, opening opportunities for uh, education systems to improve. But if you look at the inter-country comparisons, maybe there's a question mark or two uh, when it comes to validity. Likewise, there's a lot of frustration and even anger, I would say, related to the fierce national backlash against the testing uh, um, under the framework of the Common Core initiatives. Today I will talk a little bit about that. But if we start with the acknowledgement that sound educational testing, sound educational testing and assessment are integral to good teaching and learning in classrooms and necessary for evaluating school performance, rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater, I would like to propose today a mend, not end approach to testing, assessment, and evaluation. So to illustrate what we learned, I've already told you what makes a test valid is not simply um, the built-in features of the test, but also how appropriately the information is used. Now, this is a consensus-based position on validity that has been supported by the AERA and NCME uh, standards for educational and psychological testing that dates back to 1999. The thinking actually dates back before then, 
but the biggest names who, who talk about particularly the decision and the action-taking context are Messick and Cain. Um, and um, that, that is not to say that there are no other theories of validity, but this, to date, uh, seems to be the dominant view. And for the problem that we were investigating last year, this view seemed to be most useful. So when I began my work, I, I had the privilege to edit uh, um, the volumes that came out from last year's thinking. Um, I saw my role as having to frame the problem and stimulate some conversations among these folks. And they were not only leaders in measurement and evaluation, they were also education leaders and policy experts from around the world. Um, and then at the back end, I thought once they had put all their ideas and thinking on the table, it was my job to do a kind of content analysis of the principal ideas so that we could learn something from it and then pass it by them. So that's what I did. Now, once we started, we wanted some parameters to begin this work. The first was that um, what kind of it, uh, what definition of validity shall we work with? And I've already given you that. Related, there is this technical term validation in the field of educational measurement, which has to do with the formal processes for collecting evidence to support inferences and actions taken with scores and test-based reports. This work is usually carried out in by measurement and evaluation specialists. And this work should be done as a part of the test development process before tests are released. But if we look at, if we accept the definition of validity that I've given, which has to do with appropriate use of results, we must also then take into account stakeholders, people who have a vested interest in the um, outcomes of educational tests and testing programs. And they are not just the test developers, psychometricians, and affiliated researchers, but also test users at large. That includes educators, policymakers, parents, students, and the public. So as you can see, if we think of validity in that broad way, it is a shared responsibility. We can't just say, well, the test is to blame. It's all in, in the laps of the test makers and the examination builders. We have to, if we're using the tests, take some responsibility for making sure we're making we're um, taking actions that are valid. All right, so I'm now going to give you just one finding, and then I will try to extrapolate that to the Common Core Initiative. Um, now, I'm going to show you a couple of graphics. I hope I'll be able to do this well, because I hadn't realized I wouldn't have this, the pictures in front of me so um, bear with me, please, and I, I'll try to stay within the time. Now, the test use context in which I'm going to present these results uh, is the second one, that is use of tests and test-based information in teacher evaluation and school evaluation models. That includes educational accountability models. So one of our findings, and I'll have to go down, This will sound a little abstract until I show you the pictures. Um, what we end up ha seeing is conflicting assessment purposes. Theories of action or the reasons for testing conflict. Values conflict and information needs of different stakeholders 
who are at different levels of the same education system can conflict, causing tensions and resulting in some consequences. What kinds of consequences? Well, from a validity perspective, you might find strong validity evidence to support some test score interpretations and test-based information uses, but then for other uses, you will find weak or no validity evidence. And often, one of the consequences are undesirable practices or policy actions. These may be unintended consequences, some of them unforeseen, but they are, you see them mostly in high-stakes settings. Does the issue generalize internationally? And I'm going to show you two examples, one from the Netherlands, um, because Adri Vischer was here <laughs> last year, um, and, and one that I'm going to extrapolate uh, to show you how this issue plays out, uh, or ha is playing out now with the Common Core Initiative. So with the Netherlands situation, uh, Netherlands has an evaluation-centered primary school model. They call it uh, the achievement-oriented work policy. This initiative involves formative assessment that teachers have to conduct, uh, or are uh, the main players, with standardized achievement tests that are intended to guide classroom instruction and student learning uh, as a part of the day-to-day -day work culture. The results are aggregated up, however, and made public for each school for accountability purposes. The interesting thing in the Netherlands example is that relatively low stakes are tied to the test results for schools and teachers. It doesn't matter if the school didn't do so well. So the work culture is a little different. Now, the logic model, which, which is the graphic that shows the underlying assumptions of this that, that are expected to lead to the outcomes, looks something like this. At one level, at the classroom level, where the purpose of testing is formative assessment to improve instruction, and this is from our Divisha's paper, um, you use testing to get a clearer picture of students and their starting levels. You use the test to set motivating goals for students. And then you align the instructional strategies uh, to the goals, uh, leading to the processes involved in the achievement-oriented work culture, basically educational practices that support teaching and learning, leading to high student achievement levels. That's, that's the expectation in theory. At the upper organizational level, how does this play out? Well, the expectation is that a lot of complex processes will be happening, not just in the classroom. You can see what the preconditions are. Teachers must be motivated. They must know what they're doing. They must be adept at setting goals, using test-based information, all of the rest. And then at the school organization level, there, there are also several things that need to be going on. Um, and then you have uh, uh, the practical preconditions at the organizational level. So when the same test scores are posted up, aggregated up, and posted to look at the quality of a school, it provides a sliver of the information on whether or not all of this is working. So on the one hand, an inference about student learning at the classroom level might be quite sound, quite valid. But at the upper level, there might be some hit or miss going on, especially if the reforms are new. And Audrey's paper, a chapter, I should say, now it's a chapter in a book, uh, discusses what the barriers to reform implementation ha have been and how long it has taken for, to ready the schools and teachers to get to Im implement the AOW work policy. Now I'm going to turn to the US case. This, is not, this was not in our work last year, but we can extrapolate some of these findings about the validity threats on conflicting assessment purposes and theories of action. The Common Core Initiative has well-intentioned goals and mission. 
The curriculum and tests were supposed to be matched to higher standards. We're aspiring towards making students career ready, college ready with a long term view. This is a good thing, but there's a difference. The tests are being used as a policy tool to implement reforms. The order in which uh, testing gets used. Uh, I mean, if you, if you have the curriculum in place, the professional development in place and all of that, and then you implement the tests, you're going to get one kind of information. If you implement the tests very early, you're going to get another kind of information. And so now here we have something. Uh, we have, if it's a policy tool to push reforms or to get schools to change, teachers to change, and then on top of that, we have high stakes tied to results. In other words, public rewards and sanctions to schools that do well, those that don't. And then you have an unrealistic timeline. Now you have a complicated situation. It's a complicated situation with regard to validity. So here is the logic. Now, the logic, of course, these components are on the New York State Common Core Initiative um, data uh, website, and I have read the information on their website and tried to map the logic. Ideally, in evaluation, we work with stakeholders to map this together in, in dialogue with everyone involved, both in the testing area as well, uh, testing and evaluation, as well as in the curriculum development and all of that. But so people make quibble and say, no, you got it wrong. But generally, you can tell me, those of you who are involved with the Common Core Initiative, you can tell me if the logic in theory seems to be this, that the federal and state policies on education reform will result in some resources being dedicated in the school level. Those are the green boxes. Yes, there will be a Common Core curriculum and assessments. Those have to be designed. They will, uh, uh, you know, address deeper learning standards. There should be parent and family resources. The New York State uh, website acknowledges that. More importantly, there will be professional development and network teams in place to help teachers and schools implement this reform. Given that, we can assume certain school processes will happen. And guess what? Even in the Common Core Initiative formative assessment and data-driven in instruction, very much like, I mean, in, in principle, in theory, like the AOW policy in the Netherlands, you find that language. So they are student-centered in their mission and in their goals. The assumption is if you do all of that and it's happening in the right order that teachers and leaders will become more effective, in the short run, proximally, you should see higher student achievement on the common core tests, better school performance, and in the long run, more college and career ready students. Did I get this? More or less? More or less. Okay. So now let's look at what's happening. I'll give you some time to look at this one. This is in practice or in reality. Now, there's a new box here two new boxes. So we, we have the federal and state policies, that was there, and then we have test-based accountability measures where you have the public rewards and sanctions. The Common Core assessments and the curriculum are there, but if you do it very quickly under a very uncompromising timeline, some resources and implementation becomes shortchanged. There's also a short changing of the test development and validation procedures. These things take time. What happens? Look at that arrow. Instead of the processes that you had in the first picture, what's happening? Is this right? People are teaching to the test. Why are they teaching to the test? They don't want to be punished. But then let's see, let's think about what's going to happen with the information from the tests. Our students, students are going to learn based on what they're taught. And you have very renowned experts here who will tell you that the test is a sample of what the larger curriculum is, a very small sample. If you teach to the test, you're n probably not going to have lasting learning, replicable learning, 
transferable learning. You're probably not going to have school performance uh, um, indicated on those aggregated test scores because guess what? What the these processes will not be in place. So when you look at school quality, you'll be looking at a sliver and it's not even based on valid information. So, or less valid information that there might be. So as far as college and career ready students are concerned, we don't know what's going to happen. So teaching to the test is an unintended consequence and it does result in validity issues. So to conclude, I'm going to say a few things. Validity, test use, and consequences are inseparable constructs, particularly in high stakes testing situations. We do need more stakeholder dialogue and cross learning. From the earliest stages of test development, validation, and use, that means stakeholders from both sides of the aisle, not just the test developers, because it's very easy to blame one group and not take responsibility. Um, everybody has to roll up their sleeves and work together if you want to make things better. Um, from the, what the thinkers and, and the scholars who were here last year put on the table, we also have information on broader validation fram frameworks that engage stakeholders and policymakers with testing experts to anticipate and preempt some of these issues. We do need to make the reports and validity evidence understandable to the public and lay users. And as, you see, as you've seen, if we can use systems-oriented logic models, where we see the test and the testing program embedded in the larger education system, maybe it will be easier to identify what the unintended and intended consequences might be so that we can uh, work together in designing assessment programs which are nested there, but also connected with the validation and the test use phases. What could test users do? I would emphasize education and more education. If you, if you want to be more informed con consumers of tests and test-based information, more formal training of educators is necessary. Um, once they are better educated, maybe they will make better decisions supported with validity evidence. They will be able to interpret the validity evidence and curb some of the over-interpretation and over-ambitious use of tests or <coughs> test-based information. I have one thought before I end. Uh, there's a lot of anti-testing rhetoric now because of the backlash, which you will hear more about in the third session today. And there is a call for more diagnostic assessments for, uh, to support learning. And my approach is that both forms of testing, large-scale standardized testing, you know, they've existed in the United States for so long because of a public and social choice. They serve a function but they cannot do it all. They have technical limitations. We have to learn about their limitations and use them appropriately. Likewise, with diagnostic assessments to support learning, we have work to do, and we're going to hear about some of that in the second session. So um, here's to a future of testing that builds on the best from the past and looks to the future. Let me introduce the discussions really quickly. Designing in our discussant is Dr. Kent McGuire from the Southern Education Foundation. But he's also going to tell us about his own particular view of assessments. And the title of his talk is called Designing and Using Assessments to Create Learning Opportunities for Least Advantaged st Students. Let me introduce Dr. McGuire to you. Dr. McGuire is the president and CEO of the Southern Education Foundation, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. The foundation focuses on public policy and education practice from pre-K to higher education in the Southern United States. Through a variety of programs and services, 
SEF has been particularly concerned with con questions of equal access to quality education for children and youth and to the participation and success of poor and minority students in post-secondary education. Prior to joining the foundation, Dr. Maguire was the Dean of the College of Education at Temple University and a professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. Before this, Dr. Maguire was the Senior Vice President of MDRC, where his responsibilities included leadership of the Corporation's Education, Children and Youth Division. From 1998 to 2001, Dr. Maguire served in the Clinton administration as the Assistant Secretary of Education, where he served as the Senior Officer for the Department's Research and Development Agency, as the Education Program Officer for the Philadelphia-based Pew Charitable Trust. From 1995 to 1998, he managed Pew's K-12 grants port portfolio. From 91 to 95, Dr. Maguire served as the Education Pro Program D Director for the Eli Lilly Endowment. I just want you to periodically glance at that map while I talk to you and kind of discuss what, um, what, um, what we've just heard in this, in this session. Um, let me just make the central point clear from this map. Uh, what it tells us uh, is that in approximately a third of the states now, uh, a majority of the kids in public schools at least are poor. Uh, and they are overwhelmingly students of color language minorities, uh, Latinos, African Americans. In over a third of the states already. So if you, and guess what? Um, the fastest growing enrollments in the country, demand for teachers, um, all reside in those dark red state. So you're looking at the future uh, of the country, and the future is here in a third of the states now. This was not the world in which we designed the education system we have today, much less the technologies for testing and assessment that we created over the last 50 or 60 years. I'll argue those technologies were largely established to figure out who should move up to lead in the academy, uh, in business, in politics, uh, uh, and in our uh, kind of civic infrastructure. So uh, we need to figure out how to serve this new diverse majority. Uh, and we have to do it at a time when the target is moving. Uh, a succession of standards movements of which the Common Core is the most recent, I think very uh, accurately described. Uh, that's a shift. Uh, and so too are the mechanisms through which individuals learn. Um, not just books and paper, perhaps mostly not paper and books, but new digital media and social networks and communication structures that I know from uh, trying to get the attention of my own daughters dominate their attention and energy. Uh, huge questions, it seems to me, uh, about uh, what it means to learn in this new world uh, and the implications of this for, um, for assessment. Um, just a few points as I kind of react to, uh, to the presentations. My own sense is that the current assessment infrastructure is to a considerable degree at odds with this challenge. 
doesn't have to be, but I'd argue that today it's at odds with this challenge. The focus is disproportionately right now on accountability, not learning. Um, in other words, I'll assert that we have a preoccupation with generating summative information that doesn't really provide policymakers and especially school leaders or teachers with the kind of information that they will need to bring about large improvements in learning. Um, I sat on a school board for eight years in New Jersey. Um, we, uh, I was serving on the board in the midst of no child left behind. Uh, I was um, struck about NCLB as a policy design, positively so, insofar as it uh, gave some real emphasis to two core ideas. One, uh, that um, the system ought to continuously improve. And two, that we have to look below uh, large averages at subgroups. That's a pretty significant shift in policy, that it'll take a while, a generation, uh, but let's look at the subgroups uh, and let's think about them as improving continuously. And this issue that came up uh, by Dr. Brennan earlier about growth, struggled with it in terms of how to do it, but the premise was that you were looking to see continuous growth in, uh, in student learning. Um, but our actual test data, uh, the window opened up, still does, in April, closes in the middle of May, um, and then we try to end the school year, and the data emerges in the summer, it is in no way available to the teachers or the parents. It generates little or no feedback of any use or consequence to the students who took those tests. And then we start over again. Um, and the stakes are going up dramatically at the same time that this yield in terms of information for improvement seems to be going down. So it seems to me, at least, that the questions Dr. Brennan told us were of uh, the subject of great uh, intellectual attention, uh, generalizability, equating and scaling, item response theory, validity, um, continue in some sense to dominate um, at a time when we need to design a new education system. So let me. Uh, offer five quick design principles for that new system and then see if some of the issues raised for assessment uh, kind of become more, more evident. Number one, um, deeper learning. Um, we don't need the system we had. The system we have right now continues to be really good at finding the 20% of the kids uh, that uh, can move fluidly into careers and to post-secondary. But we need a system uh, that can get um, a substantial majority of kids there. Um, and that implies very different learning outcomes um, that, uh, than we have aspired to. Um, won't get those outcomes design principle number two, unless pedagogy and the structures in which teaching occur become more student-centered. Um, uh, we know that there's great variation in how people learn. A science that is shedding incre increasing light on this, a science that I think was nascent when so much of our intellectual attention in assessment uh, uh, I'll wait and see what you have to say about that, Jim, this, you know, this afternoon. Um, but we're at a point where we can no longer uh, accept wide variations in learning outcomes 
um, which means we have to increase the variation in pedagogy and learning strategies, teaching strategies. Third principle, equity. Um, uh, well, I guess that that's the really point I was just making. Um, these wide variations in outcomes are unacceptable, unlike the current system where we tolerate them freely. Uh, fitting students onto a normal curve actually forces them to exist. Then there's this principle of democracy. Um, shifting from assessment, driving what is valued, uh, to using what is valued to drive assessments. So kind of, we've got to struggle with figuring this out, I'll, I'll argue. Stakeholders, as Mahabi suggests, I think need to be involved in the earliest stages of test development. I don't think they are now. Uh, one of the reasons for the pushback around the Common Core um, and the two assessment consortia um, is that uh, the folks uh, for whom the stakes are highest were in no way involved in the conversation about what's being measured. Then there's judgment and responsibility. And here, I'm referring to a shift in culture from control and compliance, which drives behavior, drives the assumptions of the accountability system um, uh, that the uh, assessment system support to a culture in our education system, in our schools for sure, driven by professional standards. Um, my wife's a pediatrician. Yes, she has to take a test every 10 years to stay board certified. Um, but when she does that, uh, there's no one looking over her shoulder, uh, uh, evaluating her practice. There are big data systems that uh, increasingly capture information about how well patients are doing, uh, but there aren't these big public reports out trying to dis, you know, embarrass pediatricians and, and others. Um, I think we need um, a smarter balance, to use the phrase from one of the two assessment consortia, between our need to know whether the system's producing the right outcomes um, and whether it's generating enough information to um, improve practice. So what are the four or five uh, uh, assumptions or design principles undergirding smarter balance? You know, A, that assessments are grounded in a standards-based curriculum. B, uh, that it generates valid information, uh, evidence of student performance. C, that teachers are involved in scoring. D, that there is some transparency in governance. Uh, and finally, that there's continuous improvement. Move in the right direction, it seems to me. Um, and I would agree that we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, absent any data on uh, system performance, we wouldn't know how we were doing, and we certainly wouldn't know if there are subgroups of students who are being poorly served. Um, and so um, I think we need to work in this path forward to uh, a, a, a smarter balance. Um, might be good um, at a minimum if we could establish measures of school effectiveness that put our current test results in context. Um, it might be uh, better still if we could think more about uh, locating assessments earlier and continuously during the course of, a, of an academic year, uh, strike a different balance between formative uh, and summative. Uh, and it would really be great if we could uh, imagine designs that actually start with development and learning as the premise. There might be some argument about that. Some people might argue that's exactly what um, our current assessments do. Um, but what I'm getting, driving at here is thinking about assessment design for impact, um, where we think upfront about items and tasks that require students to do meaningful work. 
um, think up front about scoring and interpretive exercises that require teachers um, uh, to reflect on their practice. Um, uh, we'll see if the, uh, if the new assessments uh, align to the common core bring about these kinds of outcomes. I know no other country would put these assessments in place before putting the curriculum in place uh, and before preparing the workforce. So it'll be a really interesting question if what's coming uh, will result in or offer the kind of validity that uh, Madhabi aspires to. I don't see it. Uh, I thought your slide on the practice was quite revealing in terms of where we are. Last comment in the 30 seconds that, uh, that the, the, the timekeeper uh, affords me. Um, uh, I think this is a time for a new intellectual effort in assessment. Um, Neil Kingston leads me to wonder where the next Thorndike will come from. Um, the Gordon Commission, I think, is calling for another period of intellectual growth along the lines of the one that Dr. Brennan described, but with a new set of challenges. Um, this is what I mean by this science of learning. Um, and what we know now that we didn't know then, and how we use that uh, in thinking about assessment development going forward. So insofar as Teachers College was at the center of that last spurt in intellectual effort and growth, um, insofar as it is a home uh, for the commission's work, the Gordon Commission's work, I think TC remains central to new thinking um, about what happens in the, in the field. Uh, it is ironic to me that the United States, so much a financier of international large-scale assessment, so important to the execution of TIMS and PISA and a set of other structures and ways of knowing um, uh, that our own ability uh, to follow the practices of some of our other uh, international uh, competitors, uh, you know, that we, we are so slow to use some of the same intelligence uh, here. So I would say in closing to TC that the most significant civil rights challenge we face in this country has to do with figuring out how to educate this new diverse majority, uh, and that it will require as much intellectual leadership to pull that off um, as Teachers College exercised in creating the system we have now. Thank you all very much. My name is Andy Sternlieb, and I'm a uh second year uh, graduate student in ed policy at Teachers College. Um, this is for you. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, and, and maybe uh, uh, Ken McGuire too. Um, why do we have to have annual testing? Um, it, you know, is annual testing required to measure growth? Uh, or in some other countries, it's done uh, every other year or every third year. And are we now at the point where we're driving testing to measure adults and not necessarily doing what's right for children? Yeah, the, this, these are issues, in my view, that should be discussed ahead of setting up a testing and evaluation program by all concerned stakeholders. Uh, there is no reason why we would need annual large-scale achievement testing unless there was a reason for it, and it was agreed upon by all the key actors. Um, now, the, this issue of growth, it's very much a part of the new accountability frameworks that we're looking at, and the technical issues, there are members of this panel who can speak to that far better than I can, um, but I will say this, that it's, they're not yet ready. Those systems are not yet ready. The tests are not yet ready. And those that have been implemented um, 
are, you know, are, have problems. There are biases, there are errors, and they have been recognized uh, by measurement and evaluation specialists themselves uh, because of where we are with the design of large-scale achievement tests. Uh, so for growth testing, if that's what the stakeholders want, then maybe you do need annual testing, but what kind of a test do you need? What kinds of metrics do you need? And do we have the science and the methodologies to be able to design that? That's the issue, and I, I could put that question to members of the panel. <laughs> Kent, do you want to take? Well, um, I, I would argue that, that uh, you know, take NAEP as a case in point. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, it, it wasn't set up as an annual uh, accountability assessment. It was uh, a sample of kids um, testing different subjects over different periods of time, the premise being that it was in the country's interest to know um, if attainment was increasing um, and if we could understand something about what people were learning uh, you know, well. Um, I would argue that um, as the country has become more preoccupied with accountability, a narrative has emerged about the adults um, and the demand for a lot more data uh, that could be used uh, to hold the doubts accountable for system performance uh, have given rise to this appetite for kind of annual um, uh, information. And it's even uh, been imposed on NAEP, you know, the state NAEP, district NAEP, uh, designed to generate information in a, you know, you know, on a yearly year, yearly basis. So there's something going on there that we should we should worry about. I wonder if Dr. Brennan and Dr. Kingston would like to comment on on some of this. Um, we we've become addicted as a nation for trying to have one test serve multiple purposes. If one developed the validity arguments for a particular testing program and designed a program based on those arguments, they'd look nothing like what our accountability tests look like now. Uh, so by combining multiple purposes, we do many things poorly. Blame it on the politician. <laughs> um, do, we, do we need a measure growth on an annual basis? Um, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's so easy to answer. I, I think it depends from what perspective you ask the question and who you are as a stakeholder. For example, my son now is 37 years old, so that doesn't count, but uh, when he was in school, I certainly cared whether or not he was growing every year, not only every year, even more frequently than that. Um, as um, someone who lives in the state of Iowa, I care how Iowa is doing, and, it ha and to tell you the truth, it hasn't done very well in the past 20 years. It's progressively just gone downhill in many respects. I care about that, and I probably would like to see it every year. If my perspective were simply a national and international perspective, Maybe every two or three years would be fine. So it depends, I think, on who the stakeholders are that you are talking about. But in my mind, if a driving stakeholder isn't the child, the student, and the parent, I don't think we're going to succeed. And so I think we do really need to know or have some evidence to support a belief that we are indeed, our children are indeed growing, learning on a fairly regular and predictable well, basis. My, my just follow-up question is, if you, I mean, you could still have tests done annually, just not in every grade. So would that comparison from, you know, second graders from one year to the other with some type of algorithmic adjustment be an appropriate measure of growth to see whether the system is working, is it necessary to test every kid every year to measure growth? I would say it's pretty much the same. My answer is pretty much the same. It depends upon 
the question to, that you want answered and the context in which you, you want it answered. Um, my own personal bias is definitely in the direction of, well, I'll put it this way, I believe there's only one really legitimate purpose of any educational system. It should enable every single child to achieve the maximum of his or her potential. So I worry about the level of the kid, not just the level of entities such as states and governments and, and nations and even internationally when I consider issues of growth. If I restrict myself to simply do a national measure and that's the only thing, then what you're suggesting I think probably could be done. Um, and we have something like that, not quite that, with NAEP, which does a very good job generally of doing that. But what NAEP does is simply not sufficient. It's been around a long time. It's done a great job for what it was intended to do. But as time has, grown, has gone on, we've seen what the consequences are. We have basically stayed the same as a country, and we fell behind everybody else. It isn't working. Jude, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether I directly comment on your question, but there are a few things that that I want to react on. Uh, you should know I'm a curriculum person. I'm not a measurement person. <coughs> so, um, and I was, uh, I liked what Ken said, that we have to change thinking from, I think you said, assessment-driven teaching towards teaching or curriculum-driven assessment. And uh, I have many years in IA involved in achievement. But I mean, as a curriculum person, I'm realizing life of a child, and that's what you said, is more than only performing on tests, on mathematics or language or whatever. Uh, as a curriculum person, I like to point also my assessment friends to the fact that usually we look at three sources for what should be addressed in school in the curriculum. One source is the traditional subject. You may call it cultural heritage, math, science, languages, and so on. But we also have to prepare our young people for becoming a responsible, responsive citizen. And if you take all the social media nowadays and all the challenges for kids around uh, how to behave to others, bullying and so on, I, you, you know better than I do. That's one aspect. Another aspect is preparing or educate for personal development. That is especially important in primary and secondary school, because there you prepare young people for the choice of what do I want to become, what do I want to study after compulsory education. And from my perspective, I think there is a risk that we too much focus on the traditional subjects and achievements and pay too little attention to the other issues. I'm very glad that the Gordon Committee is coming in the next session because there we talk about assessing for 21st century skills or uh, capabilities. Just one anecdote. Uh, our previous Minister of Education in the Netherlands is fond of tests of math and science and language. And she made a complete program focusing on the improvement of the Netherlands on PISA and the like. And when I ask a civil servant, and what about all the other things I just mentioned, he says, we'll wait till the next minister. <laughs> uh, I use this as an anecdote to say, let us keep a wide perspective if we talk about mm -hmm. assessing and measurement, because there is so many challenges which are also important. Thank you.